Hello and welcome to this video on the history and impact of educational policies in the United Kingdom. Educational policy refers to the plans, strategies, instructions and recommendations introduced by government. Most educational policy is a response to the following issues. Equal opportunities, selection and choice, control of education, marketization and privatization. So different governments of different persuasions will have different views on what needs to be done to deal with these challenges or to improve certain issues in the UK education system and they implement policies uh, as they so see fit. Some policies have contributed to maintaining inequality. Others have sought to reduce it. Prior to the 1870s, the vast majority of people who lived in the United Kingdom were uneducated. And prior to the Industrial Revolution, there were no state schools. The state did not provide any form of education. Education was available for the rich and powerful, for the landed aristocracy and the royalty, who sent their children to fee-paying schools. Some churches and charities provided education for the poor, and you needed to be very lucky to live nearby to those institutions in order to receive this. Most people probably would have learned some very basic literacy and numeracy from their parents or grandparents, but very few were able to even write their own name at this point in time. This is because the state spent no money on education and did not feel that it was its role to do so. In 1870, however, this all changes with the implementation of the Forster Education Act. Industrialization had increased the need for an educated workforce, and so the state introduced elementary education for five to ten year olds in 1870. Attendance was made compulsory until age 10 in 1880, and the curriculum offered a very basic understanding of what was known as the four R's, namely reading, writing, arithmetic, and religion. So it was very basic literacy, numeracy skills, and a basic understanding of religious ideas and doctrine, namely Christianity. Between 1880 and 1940, there were some small increments by which the age of compulsory attendance was increased. But the next big milestone was in 1940 with the Butler Education Act. This introduced free education for all between 5 and 15 years. It aimed to provide equality of educational opportunity for all children. So the hope was that all elementary schools would be increasingly teaching similar material and that the teachers would be of similar ability. It also introduced what was known as the tripartite system, which actually means the three-part system, whereby all students must sit a test at the age of 11, known as the 11 plus, and based on the outcome of those tests, pupils would then be allocated to one of three school types. The first type of schools were grammar schools, and these were for those students who passed the 11 plus and were therefore seen as bright, intelligent and clever. They received an academic education. They learned an academic curriculum. They were taught by teachers who were middle class, who were university graduates themselves, who perhaps had attended a grammar school also. And they tended, that is the students, to come from middle class backgrounds. And so this was a way for middle class parents to have their children receive almost a private school quality education, but on the state's dime. Secondly, we have secondary modern schools, and these were for the vast majority of students who failed the 11 plus. They were considered to be non-academic and received, for the most part, a practical education, although there would be some basic tuition in English language and literature, maths and science. These students tended to be working class, and so these made up the vast majority of students and the vast majority of schools. There was a third type of school known as technical schools or technical colleges, but these weren't very well funded or bankrolled by the state, and so therefore they existed in very few areas. These were for students who were a mixture of middle class and working class who perhaps had passed the 11 plus, but they themselves were more interested in a hands-on education, perhaps with a view to becoming an engineer or to working with... Uh, large elements of construction. And so, because so few of these schools existed, 
sociologists have argued that actually the tripartite system was in fact a bipartite system or a two-part system. This system aimed to promote meritocracy, the idea that if you worked hard, you would be rewarded. If you had innate intelligence, you would be rewarded and have the opportunity to receive a top quality education. But in reality, the 11 plus had an inbuilt middle class bias. Plus, girls had to gain a higher grade to pass. And so this reproduced class and gender inequalities in the UK education system. The next big milestone was in 1965 with the implementation of what was known as the comprehensive system. By this time, a new Labour government had taken power and they were unhappy with the tripartite system and the inherent elitism that it seemed to breed. And so they aimed to overcome the class divide of the tripartite system and make education more meritocratic. As a result, the 11 plus was abolished, along with grammar and secondary modern schools. So no new grammar schools could be created, and the vast majority of schools became what were known as comprehensive schools. And these were for all students in the area. Local education authorities, or LEAs, were created in every borough, and they would oversee all the schools in that borough. However, the decision to go comprehensive was handed to LEAs, and unfortunately, not all LEAs decided to go comprehensive. And so many retained the grammar secondary modern divide. And even today, this still exists. Although, as we will see later, many schools have now become academies. There are some different sociological perspectives on comprehensives. Functionalists would argue that the mixing of children in different social classes would increase social solidarity. And so in this sense, this would be a positive thing. It would help build connections between the working and middle classes. However, Ford found, however, that there was little mixing due to streaming students according to ability. And so what you tended to find was in the top streams, you had the middle class students effectively receiving a grammar style education. And in the bottom streams, you had the working class students effectively receiving a secondary modern style education. Functionalists would also argue that comprehensives are more meritocratic as it gives pupils more time to show their abilities rather than just selecting at age 11. One can only imagine how impactful that might have been to have studied and taken an exam at the age of 11 and to be told that either you were a success or a failure. Marxists, however, would argue that the comprehensive system does not challenge streaming and labelling, thus it denies working class students equal opportunities, and it reaffirms what is known to Marxists as the myth of meritocracy, the idea that this is an illusion put forward by the middle classes to prevent the proletariat from re realising their exploitation. The next big step or milestone was in 1988 in the guise of the Education Reform Act. Margaret Thatcher and the Conservative government sought to introduce a market into the education system. This process would be continued by the Labour government in 1997 until their leaving of office in 2010, as well as the coalition government in 2010 to 2015, and is now being continued with the Conservative government in 2015 onwards. <clears throat> They wanted more consumer choice and competition between schools. They aimed to reduce direct state control over education. This is Margaret Thatcher's government once again. And a key policy at the heart of marketization is parentocracy or rule by parents, giving power to parents to make decisions on their children's behalf. Parentocracy includes publication of league tables and Ofsted reports. So parents can either look at newspapers or today they would go online and download the league tables and Ofsted reports to find out how schools in their local area are doing with a view to deciding where they're going to send their children. Business sponsorship of schools, the idea of trying to get businesses into schools to teach children about the private sector and about how businesses operate. Open enrolment, allowing successful schools to recruit more pupils. Historically, LEAs would say to each school, you may recruit X amount of students. Under the Education Reform Act, if a school was doing very well, they were able to disregard what the LEA said and actually enrol as many students as wanted to come and that they could provide a good education for. The creation of specialist schools. So in certain areas, schools would perhaps specialise in a particular subject like maths or science. 
formula funding, schools receiving the same amount of funding for each pupil. Previously, schools received different amounts of funding depending on where they were in the country or depending on the type of student they were. Today, or as a result of the Education Reform Act, the idea was that there would be a formula. Every student would be worth the same amount, therefore attract more students and have more money. Finally, schools competing to attract pupils. So schools were going to have to market themselves, very similar to what a business might do in order to market its product. And the hope would be that by competing, the best schools would rise to the top and attract more pupils. And the schools that perhaps would not be doing so well would struggle and fail and collapse, ultimately. The neoliberal new right favour marketization, arguing that successful schools will thrive, whilst failing schools will go out of business. The funding formula means that students, or some students, become more attractive to schools than others, as they are likely to achieve high grades. And in particular, we find that schools want to attract middle class pupils, they often want to attract more girls than boys, and they'll often want to attract perhaps more white or Chinese students. Ball and Whitty have argued that marketization reinforces existing inequalities. Actually, it causes some schools to become, in effect, grammar schools, but selective, and it causes some other schools, in effect, to become secondary modern schools. Will Bartlett noted that because parents are attracted to schools with good league rankings, that it encourages schools to engage in two types of behavior. These are known as cream skimming and silt shifting. By cream skimming, if you think about the process of acquiring cream, you get the milk and you churn it, the cream rises to the top and you skim it off. What schools were effectively doing was a similar thing. They would see all the students who were applying to their school and they'd work out, okay, where do these students live? Are they female? Are they middle class? What is their background? And they would skim off what they believed to be the best students or the students most likely to get the top grades, leaving the rest to apply to other schools. In terms of silt shifting, it's the same, but the exact opposite to cream skimming, if you will. When you are panning for gold, you pick up some dirt or earth or some water in your pan and you shake it back and forth to find the gold and you get rid of all of the dirt. This is similar to what schools were doing here. Essentially, they would find ways to get rid of students they, see, they saw as being problems, often white working class boys or black working class boys, or indeed students who have learning difficulties who are more expensive to teach. And so they would find a way to sort of stave them off and get them to go to the other schools in the area. This results ultimately in the reproduction of class inequality and other inequalities too. In terms of the funding formula, schools are allocated funds on a formula based on how many pupils they attract. Popular schools get more funds. As a result, they can recruit better teachers and build better facilities. Their popularity allows them to be more selective, attracting more able and ambitious middle-class applicants. Unpopular schools lose income, lose their best teachers, facilities fall into disrepair, they fail to attract pupils, and thus the funding is further reduced. So what we're seeing here, in effect, is two self-fulfilling prophecies, one of success and one of failure. The Institute for Public Policy Research, sometimes simply referred to as IPPR, found that the competition-orientated education systems like Britain's produce more segregation between children of different social backgrounds. So it appears to have a negative impact in that sense. Next, we move on to the new Labour years of 1997 to 2010. By 1997, many had now argued that parentocracy was in fact a myth, as only middle-class parents were able to take advantage of the system. Stephen Ball argued that parentocracy simply disguised class inequality. And you may want to consider this question, in what way is this similar to the myth of meritocracy that you will have heard about when doing your Marxism and education reading? The new Labour government of Blair and Brown, as seen in the top left-hand corner, sought to introduce policies to reduce inequality. These policies included deprived areas designated education action zones and provided extra funding, aim higher programmes to encourage underrepresented groups into higher education or university, education maintenance allowance, money for poorer students to attend further education, reduction of class sizes, introduction of city academies, this would be the forerunner of the academy programme that we'll talk about in a moment, 
This was a fresh start for underperforming inner city schools. So they get to rebrand or rename themselves. They would get money to build, rebuild. They get some money to attract new teachers, get some money to um, you know, do other bits and pieces around school to try and improve it and start again. And finally, increase funding for education generally. And this is summed up very well in Tony Blair's very famous quote in the or at the Labour Party conference just prior to him becoming Prime Minister, where he said, ask me my three main priorities for government, and I tell you, education, education, education. That was a big deal in 1996 and seven. There have, however, been criticisms of New Labour. Melissa Benn argued that there was a contradiction between continued commitment to marketisation and tackling inequality. The introduction of EMAs helped students stay in education, but then the new Labour government implemented university tuition fees, which deterred many working class students from attending university. New Labour also failed to abolish fee paying private schools, which we know still for the most part gain the top grades in the UK, or to remove their charitable status, which would have put them on a better par, shall we say, with state schools. Next, we have the policies of the coalition government from 2010 to 2015. These were the policies of the conservative Liberal Democrat coalition, and in particular, the policies of Michael Gove. They produced, as they came together in 2010, what was known as the coalition agreement, setting out their vision for education amongst other policy areas. They stated they wanted to promote excellence whilst freeing schools from the dead hand of the state. From 2010, all schools were encouraged, firstly, to leave local education authority control. In doing so, they would then convert to academies. This is an extension of what Labour had looked to do previously. And to receive funds directly from the Department for Education rather than from the LEA. Unlike new Labour city academies, any school could do this and it removed the focus on tackling inequality. So instead, it was about freeing up schools, no longer necessarily about tackling inequality. The coalition also introduced free schools. These were funded by the state, but they were run by parents, charities, businesses and faith groups rather than the local education authority. So the idea here was if a group of parents or a business realised that there were no good schools in their local area or a new school needed to be opened up, they could apply to the government for the money to start a brand new school. And the hope was to try and diversify the education sector and to bring new types of people, new groups into it. The aim is to take control away from the state and to give it to parents, especially when they are unhappy with the provision in that area. However, there have been some criticisms of the coalition's policies. Rebecca Allen, having looked at how free schools operate in Sweden and the United States, found that educational standards fell and international rankings were lost. So actually they had a negative impact. Any success was a product of using socially divisive pupil selection and exclusion policies, so similar to the cream skimming and silt shifting we were thinking about earlier. And evidence suggests that is from the DOV or Department for Education in 2012 that free schools take fewer disadvantaged pupils than other nearby schools. So there are some problems there. Whilst the coalition's policies are believed to have increased inequality, they also introduced policies aimed at reducing it, such as free school meals for all children in reception year one and year two, although recently there has been some scaling back of this program. Introduction of the pupil premium, extra money for schools with students from disadvantaged backgrounds. This was intended to be a replacement for EMA, but there is far less money available. However, the coalition's austerity program, that is seeking to reduce government spending, meant that they ended EMA, as previously stated, tripled university tuition fees to £9,000, and more recently we're now starting to see that these are going above £9,000, closed Sure Start centres, and cut the building schools for the future program by 60%. That's it. Thank you very much.